These very small drawings are from 7071, and um, they're done with a tiny croquil. I started showing my work in New York in about 52, and they had different titles for a while, poetic, I suppose. And then in 56, I decided for the rest of my life to do only one thing, that is to paint the origin of the universe. So all the paintings from then on are called Genesis, and they just have numbers like Genesis number one, uh, 1968, or uh, 2010, number five. This particular series of 12 drawings were done, as I said, during those three years. I did nothing for three years but work on 12 tiny drawings, two, two and a half by two inches. And they represent the microcosm and the macrocosm. And that means that I can, in one drawing, for instance, this could be uh, mitosis, the, the reproduction of plants. This could be a star. Uh, this could be tiny creatures. So in that suite of 12 drawings, I want to include the microcosm, the macrocosm, and stuff in between. For instance, this one is very basic, thinking about black holes and white holes and the intercha interchangeability of that in terms of the macrocosm. <laughs> Actual galaxies, because somebody came along during that period and said, well, you know, you're doing all this little doodling and scribbling, but uh, can you draw? <laughs> so. I said, well, these are actual galaxies, that's N951, and that's the only realistic aspect in this series. The role of metaphor in art, and the fact that these are actual pieces of paper and ink, and they are therefore uh, not a reliable uh, verisimilitude of the world around us, but rather they are a metaphor, like a poem, visual poem. When I started, this series, and they're all called Genesis, it has to do with the idea of cosmology being just a great big umbrella for everything that is that we are aware of. Uh, our everyday world, the world around us, probably the galaxy, galaxy groups, universe, multiverse. And it started out with the Big Bang Theory, and then the steady state theory, and then the local bubble in the steady state, and then finally, boom, the Einsteinian world and the quantum world started to dance in terms of our philosophy and theology and theory. He used the title of Genesis as a metaphor for origin, not just a universe, but every moment. When we started this discussion, you, that is, the instrument that is now talking to me and I talking to it, and the person who is standing in back of the instrument, the videographer, we are into a dialogue. This happens to be an auditory and a visual, but there's also an empathetic dialogue. Every moment is a unique moment. So for me, the term Genesis is not religious. Uh, it is both scientific and it is, <laughs> in terms of language, a way to enter into the mystery of the metaphorical world. Here is a drawing back there, and there, as I'm thinking about origin, I'm thinking about the very feeling that the brush, when it writes its own language, this is a no-write, by the way, at this point it is only a language of energy, and there's no lexicon available right now. I'm sure you looking at this can create your own sentence structures and your own probably contradiction as they contradict each other. But when I'm working, then it isn't as I am actually describing anything, but rather there is a union of the brush or the pencil or the pen or whatever, and the flowing viscous media, and the surface talking back. And I don't really know what I'm doing. Uh, in fact, what's interesting is that I was for a while in Florence, Italy, and a filmmaker from Germany, Herr Wolf, came up to, to Fiesole, where a friend of mine and I were painting in a tiny villa. My friend was painting like Rembrandt and Vermeer. That was his world. I was doing my work. He came into Richard Seren's work, and 
Stop, he said. He shouted, Ach du Lieber, was haben wir hier? This is ja. And he used the word blasphemy. For my friend Dick Sarah, to paint like Rembrandt in at that time was 1966, I guess, was for him blasphemy. He just charged out and told his crew, get out of here. I was uh, in the, he was in the 17th century place, I was in the 16th century place. He looked at me and he says, Ach du Liebe, da ist ein anderer. Uh, good God, there's another one. Ein amerikanischer Doodler. So I was actually flattered <laughs> to be the American Doodler. Because in doodling, you're working with your body and your mind, but not focused on an actual script. The idea of energy releasing itself and transforming itself. So as we're going through the different paintings and drawings, it is energy transformation. Some of my work, I have paintings that have taken 20 years, and that painting only took 15 seconds. And what happens is, black canvas, then, within 15 seconds, and one, two, three, four brush strokes, I've tried to, if you will, write the biography and history of those 15 seconds. And I couldn't even talk about it because that language is much too slow. This language is quicker. However, in doing small drawings, this is 1961. At that time, I was working on rice paper and I was working with the idea of Japanese calligraphy. And the moment, the chi, that is the energy spontaneously emerging from your body, from the universe through your body onto this rice paper. And this is also and it, I did like maybe 50 or 60 and threw them all away except for this one. Because this one had that energy. It's like when you are trying to write a poem and you go and you struggle for a couple of months and then one day after you wake up and you're still sleepy and you happen to walk by your desk, you go doodle 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 and then you wake up and you say, where did that come from? So being able to not only be careful about building a skyscraper or a, a, uh, a, de a design of technology, your, your inherent, the ambient energy transformation, which is you and me, can do things that the spontaneity has an analog in the world of technology. So in this case, I'm working with color. And again, it is not a description of, let's say, a star field or a amoeba or uh, a group of galaxies. It's rather through color, through hue, value, saturation, through brushstroke, which is, you know, you swimming in the viscous world of acrylic paint. I'm, I think I might have tried to evoke an echo. Uh, when you think about a galaxy, you're looking at a photograph through a telescope, which could either be a, a visual using uh, all the filters. So imagine a series of color filters, each of them hearing in a different vibrational frequency. And then you add on top of that, let's say, um, a radio telescope information. And then on top of that, infrared image. Now, which one of these many photographs that you see is the correct one? Well, of course, it's not. Because as you breathe in and breathe out, I just breathed in. There happens to be the air at this instant, in this moment, in this room. Whew. Now I'm already destroying the neutrality of it with this other. So as the world changes over centuries, eons, and as it also changes in seconds, nanoseconds, it's all part of the composite picture of what is the unknown, which is why I call this all Genesis. Here's a painting on plexiglass, but there are many, many layers of an acrylic material that is acrylic and uh, marble dust to make a surface that is almost like paper. And then for about a couple of years, this is done with a very fine number one brush. I worked with trying to combine, in terms of the Genesis concept, of the West and the East. The West with its more uh, control interest, power, and then you have the intuitive Eastern culture. Well. 
imagine this being the eastern chakras. The ch chakras are energy centers in Buddhism, in Hinduism, and in Kabbalistic Middle Eastern. So here are the energy centers as superimposed of three different cultures. Or here is the Big Dipper. There's Mr. North Star, which I borrowed from the Little Dipper. And the Big Dipper has a binary star. The, the, essentially, on this schema, on this diagram, the, down here, the diagram is mostly the, the, the domain of human consciousness. This is more the mysterious, sensitive concept. That, so I got the binary star of the Big Dipper actually holding down this schema. Now that's going at an awesome rate as they are whirling around each other, as these systems of human interaction are whirling around each other. So this is sort of like the only work I've ever done that's diagrammatic, and yet it also, I'm paying homage to flowers. <laughs> Why? Because flowers come from seeds, and then these incredible, beautiful things sprout from a rather ordinary-looking hunk of brown stuff. And it can work on all four sides, as you see. And it, when, I, when I have so-called completed it, I take it out on a tree that's about 30 feet away, turn it on all four sides. And then it goes under daylight, fluorescent light, incandescent light, and candlelight so that it has to work, if you will, visually, on all of these, uh, I would say, uh, available visualizations. Now this is uh, how all these paintings started. This surface, which each time that I've <coughs> uh, smoothed it out and sanded it out, it's almost like paper, but it's, plastic, it's plexiglass. And then with acrylic and a tiny brush, not a pen. I start the work. Now this triangulation, we'll get into it in just a minute, and it actually on paper with a crow crow. So imagine every aspect of the universe which thinks itself as a solo singer is interactive and is interrelated. And how these energy centers uh, are for a split second are stand-ins for experience, or for actual objects, or for systems, or for when it comes to the microscopic world of that which is invisible. Though now we have, thanks to Mr. Galileo and the rest of the folks, we have the visual, observable, and we have electron microscopes that work with actually the shadow of the object itself. So we've developed instruments for being able to go what previously was the unknown. And as it reveals itself, which before was non-existent, but it was, we are expanding our sensory organic world. And this just happens to be me stopping by for a moment, thinking about the interaction of the awesome universe, the tiny micro world, and energy transforming itself to this which I just finished, well, not finished, completed. And so imagine over a year or two working with this instrument, the brush and paint, but being very aware that if I think I'm working, I already have stopped the evolution of this work. Rather, I'm playing. Okay, in play, something different happens not work. All of your awareness is now being happily free to speak in terms of joy instead of, of control, compunction, or power. So each time I get back to this painting, I have to start playing again, which means I have to reverse my edge back down to which is my most playful age. So in allowing the body to be itself in the moment, incredible things can happen. So over two years, this began to slowly evolve from object on canvas to a chorus, an organic chorus of chromatic, I would say, 
interaction. Imagine being an observer as a galaxy emerges over billions of years. Or imagine you're in a petri dish and there what before was just nothingness starts to become whatever, a microorganism. So I've included both the universe in its more dramatic big form and in its intimate form using color as a way to move fore and aft. But the important thing is how to balance these different perceptions. And obviously, if I try to do this consciously, I'd be in a lot of trouble. Imagine trying to ice skate and keep thinking about the, your ice skate hitting the ice. And are you going to go as fast as you could if you were just saying, ah, let me go? So this genesis, the most recent one I just completed, is utilizing a figure ground because if you look, suddenly something comes forward as a figure and then it moves back and the ground becomes the conscious discusser with you. Sophisticated material, namely just a, uh, a flare pen. And so I'm doodling and doodling with a flare, what normally you use to sign your checks, if people still use checks. They still have checks and balances, though I don't know if they use the balance of law and justice like they used to. So, first of all, there is a negative space, meaning nothing is there, like before the moment of consciousness, what was there before? <laughs> then there is a, a field with something that is a bit more sharply focused, and then something that seems to slither in and out of space. So maybe this is a microcosm, and maybe this is a macrocosm. Could this be the galaxy on its side? I don't know, because that wasn't really what I was trying to do. It's only that later on people said, oh, is that of this? Is that of that? And I said, sure. Because it really comes out of nowhere, the nowhere being all of this. And at a certain point I say, okay, this will lead me to the next work, though it happens to be the very humble material, as I say, a ballpoint pen and paper. These, on the other hand, full-blown in chromatic world. In some of the more recent ones, you will see a world or a point of origin and then something. In other paintings, I will let it all evolve without any separations or distinctions. But it was a, a while, a long time ago, when somebody said, you know, you're constantly floating around like this. You know, you've got to be grounded. <laughs> and I realized, yeah, uh, what does it mean to be grounded? We observe from the Earth. That's our point of view. By the way, the astronauts are now doing it from a slightly different place. So the, the, the pull and push between that which is the moment and that which is later, or the ground you're standing on, and moving you know, from the cave into the forest, into the little city, into a starship. These changes within us I find fascinating. So in, in a series where you see, if you will, perhaps this is the Earth, perhaps this is the beginning of the discussion by saying, what is the topic today? Well, the topic today, it's a, uh, uh, what? It's an egg sandwich. <laughs> okay, this is 1954. And at that time I was studying at Cranbrook Cranbrook Academy of Art for my master's. And my teacher, Zoldan Sabashi from Budapest, Hungary. We all, Cranbrook at that time was master apprentice system, no classes or anything. He, you know, let Richard Seren, my friend who lives in Florence, uh, who, you know, was doing Rembrandt work and so forth. He was the mentor for both of us, so he could talk to him about Renaissance and to me about modern art. And then I said, uh, Sep, you know, I'm just going to be drawing for a while. For about three months, I went into the Cranbrook meadows and forests, would lie down in the meadow and just draw self-portraits because I became the critters that were running around in there. And I thought the idea taught me something about empathy, even though we think about it between humans, like I feel you know, your energy, you feel mine. 
uh, animals and creatures of all kinds really communicate. And so I did a whole series of these, when I say self-portraits, I'm of course meaning it as a metaphor. Uh, how, how, can we, how can we relate to nature? So going from 54 to 64, 74, 84, 94, 2004, 2014, now we're 18, uh, I've been thinking and worrying about this question of empathy. And it's still a complete mystery to me because, uh, you know, I'm a tree hugger and uh, each tree gives me a different conversation. And it's a canvas. I think what I was trying to do, now this is many years later, is to create a figure ground. I keep talking about that. That's an, an end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, a German uh, approach towards psychology, Gestalt psychology it's called. The figure, the ground, for instance, if you look at an orchestra and suddenly somebody's playing the violin, that's the figure because she has gone from the group out to you. And she disappears and becomes the first violinist. So the figure becomes the ground. And as you're listening to a symphony, then you will see this interchange which the composer uses in order to go from the individual concept to the group. Well, that was the problem, if you will, but not really a problem. That was what I was playing with. How could this disappear. If I use daylight, one thing happens. Fluorescent light where I'm in now something else. So this painting will speak in different languages, like a translator at the UN is able to talk to you. Well, ich kann ein bisschen Deutsch mit ihr sprechen, oder je parle français, in der Tarif Arabi. So there are different ways. Same person, different languages. And here, the language is how can I exactly balance foreground and background? So this would be like memory and moment. Can I remember what I said to you just 15 minutes ago? Probably not, because I'm 88, and my memory cubes are not like they used to be when I was 21. So that took about maybe a year or so to balance it just right. More the real object concept of which I wanted to speak about the instant of the Big Bang, which is, of course, a concept that we are speaking about. What do you mean, Big Bang? <laughs> you couldn't hear anything. It is, how did the universe begin 14.7 uh, billion years ago? Uh, if you were in the Renaissance, you'd have one concept, right? You go all back before Copernicus, and you got a completely different concept. Every culture you go to has a different origin idea. And right now, for instance, as I mentioned earlier, you will have a change between the original world, sun revolving on the earth, and as it changes, still the idea of was there in the first nanosecond something going on? However, the irony is that this is canvas. At one time, this piece of canvas was a gigantic nine by 14 foot piece of canvas that was printed by a machine that 3M had, and it's called a scanner mural, of which a painting that I had painted over a couple of years time with brush and casein was photographed. That photograph was taken to this machine in Los Angeles, and that machine spit out on a 10 by 15 foot a drum. I cut a section out of that giant canvas which is, you know, probably three by two foot. And then began playing with it, saying, can I get before the universe ever was? And then can I be right there as it starts? Can I do that? So it represents, therefore, it's like in your dream when a fascinating thing happens and you just barely remember when you wake up what you dreamt. So I tried to, this is not a calm painting. This is a painting where it all happens in a split nanosecond, but it's only an imagination. So I'm not sure why this is my game board and the, the game that I'm playing of how can I talk about moments of creation. 
which have to do with when a thought gets to be a thought, or when a child is actually born, having been around for nine months before, uh, how a culture begins, expands, and changes. For me, these brief moments of trying to paint something are moments of where all that other stuff leaks in, and I have to try to make this bouillabaisse into a dish that is tasty. My wife and I went on a uh, sabbatical a few years ago on the uh, QUE, that is the Queen Elizabeth, that wonderful big boat, larger than a lifeboat but smaller than a planet. And uh, while everybody else was doing what they were doing, I found a deck chair. And for the next six days, on my way back from France to the US, I doodled with a ballpoint. And though I missed all the fun about all the parties and everything else. So the fun of just sitting there on the ocean, going across the Atlantic, and I've been across many times. I realize now, much later, that, oh, I was grounded, but I was grounded on a ship on the Atlantic, which is above, you know, what's down here. What is down here? I can't go down to the Magna, but at least I can go to the crust of the earth. And at night, when I go way up high and try to get into a dark spot, not that many lights, and I see billions and billions and billions, as he said, stars and galaxies and so forth, but I was selecting only one. So is it the moon? Is it the sun? Is it looking through a microscope? I spent uh, the summer of 71 with Dr. Roman Vishniak, who was a microbiologist who works through the microscope. What is the background so-called? It's the quietness of just hearing the ship go shh. Or is it the stars singing very quietly? Watch out, Earth people. Watch out. Don't go too weirdo. Watch out. Think about. Think about. I love to, to play, not just to play with the actual tools of art, brushes, pencils, pens, and so forth. But I love to play, as we do with words and languages, just with notions and for those six days, my game was, how can I be this when at any moment I can mess it up? And as we landed, I did the last little stroke. Everything here is done in crayon, but it's called oil pastel. It's pastel that has a, a different composition. Crayons are usually 90% wax and 10% pigment. These are 90% pigment and 10% oil and wax. So therefore, I'm really getting real color. So I'm doodling, as you can see. And it's all the things that we've talked about, all the things you've seen. But they have a slightly different work. If you think about a composer, let's take Mozart, for instance. You could say, yes, I recognize what he does. This is not Brahms or Beethoven or Tchaikovsky. This is Mozart because of his interests. So you can probably see it's the same language that I'm using in general, but it has different concerns. It's like each of us, who are we when we sleep, when we eat breakfast, when we quote, go to work, when we travel, when we're with a hundred people or only one person, we're the same person. And these different experiences are a kind of travelogue, a kind of travelogue through whatever are my notions of play. This one just completed, it's not even framed yet. And, you know, if you and I were talking about it today and then you were talking about it next week, I might have different interpretations. Because bottom line, as Herr Wolf, the filmmaker, said about my work when he saw it in Florence is, that's his an American, an American doodler. Meaning that, you know, he doesn't even know what he's doing. So on the one hand, here are a lot of work, but bottom line is, genuinely, authentically, I really don't know what I'm doing. Because if I could explain it, I would be a poet, I would be a writer, I would be a politician. <laughs> so uh, I beg forgiveness of you and I getting together in this discussion and whatever I say, take it with a gallon, a tank car full of salt, because I really don't know what I'm doing. 
this one I might have a little bit more of a notion, but not, you know, I won't exaggerate. Uh, casein on rice paper. And the rice paper is stretched on stretchers like you would have an oil painting. And it started out in casein, a water-based paint, which is a paint that uh, oil painting started sort of in the uh, 15, what, 50 or 60 by the Van Eyck brothers. And my teacher had, uh, started me out with drawing with a coke quill, drawing human anatomy full-sized from Gray's anatomy and studying Renaissance art and then, you know, all the way through. So if you think about a, a writer, a dancer, a poet, uh, so forth, who say, you know, what are your sources? Well, okay, my actual beginnings was with, Rem with uh, Albrecht Dürer. And then comes Rembrandt. Then a hop, skip, zoom, all the way to Van Gogh. And my world was of a Van Gogh and Monet. And then when I went to Syracuse, and I would walk around and see what's going on in museums and galleries. And boom, I bumped into Kandinsky. So, hey, I was absolutely, I became Kandinsky and I became clay. The Guggenheim at that time was a mansion on Fifth Avenue from the Countess Rebay, and I used to go in there, and there were clays sitting on the floor, and there were these giant Kandinsky's and this horrible Bauer, whom the Countess, I guess, thought was as good as Kandinsky. In fact, when we came back to Syracuse, my friend and I wore big buttons that said K on people. What, what's the K? Kandinsky! Who's that? So, but then I started photographing with a good, uh, nice old camera the works that I saw, and they were de Kooning and Rothko and Gorky and Pollock and you name it. And I would come back and show my friends these 35 millimeter slides because the art historians stopped at the Impressionism. By that time I had skipped all that stuff and I was now into the 10th Street galleries. I became modernized. I was a Renaissance recluse who jumped into the modern era. Well. This is a kind of, not a lexicon, not a dictionary, uh, but a kind of, in one work, how can I really, really, really create something that is and that isn't? If this is a galaxy on its side, and if this is looking through the microscope, this could also be a dark, uh, well, a dark star, shall we say, dark hole, and this, you know, could just be a moment in time. And all this calligraphy could be what used to be called the ether. But you could solve, you could say, well, it's, it's the world around us, the everyday world. So this became a kind of a giant metaphor for this confusion with us between, for instance, chronological time and kairos being the metaphysical time. And then add another one, sidereal. Sidereal is what an astronomer uses when they say, well, let's see now, sidereal, because they're looking at billions and billions instead of billions and billions of seconds. So this one, this rice paper little world, was for me at that moment, which is in the 80s, yeah, 98, a kind of stopping a minute and just saying, okay, it's this, it's this, but they're reversible, what are they? And this one is probably a midpoint, an in-between point of both color, energy, uh, symbolic interaction, where it is again oil pastel. And I was being, I, I realized later on, I was being very, very playful. Now I mentioned earlier the idea of all my painting is done as if it's play. And here we are with a relationship between micro and macrocosm, but more as if I'm just stepping out into the green forest and I'm just singing and I'm just dancing. Uh, for me, nothing is planned, so I don't sit there with a sketch and then say, okay, now this is a sketch and this is a painting. This has been through many stages. And at one point, the whole painting was sort of like this. 
And as it started to, uh, you know, in a conversation with two people, some, and you're listening, you're the, you're the third person listening. As compared to a lot of my work, which is a dialectic, there is person A and person B, and they're talking, and hopefully in between that Zwischenraum, which is what the dialectic creates, something new emerges. Well, here, as I started playing with it and evolving, I suddenly realized, wait a minute, these were remnants from earlier stages. And they looked to me, and that became figurative in my mind, as, a t as two stars revolving, a binary star. Uh, some of them revolve very quickly, and some of them very long. And then I started isolating this section from everything else. Like a writer would look and say, hmm, wait a minute, throw, the, throw away two chapters, rewrite this one, having some of the spark of the earlier one. In a poem, somebody writes, and then in the margins with red pen, writes, wait a minute. And that's the draft being, ma the manuscript or the draft is being changed as you work with it. So there was this dialectic, if you will, between the real world and this earlier dream world. And I began thinking about this relationship. This is done just, uh, I don't know, a couple of years ago. And I went back to the earlier work where both brushwork and drip work was going simultaneously. And before I knew it, I realized that I was there being very, <clears throat> okay, that's it. So no two years or three years or whatever. I became more argumentative with my part of the conversation like that. I needed to be in the moment, to be aware of the, the reality that I'm in that I don't know anything about. And so uh, I defied what would be the normal routine of the painting and just, I wanted to stand completely naked and let the lion of reality eat me up. Thank you. Um, I work flat. I don't work from an easel at all. The only reason I have a lot of easels around here is so I can look at the paintings in their changes. So a work like this, let's say in a studio session, I might be working on two or three paintings at once. Like, okay, right now I, I would leave this and I would set it aside, bring another painting in. But I've got to be aware of if I move from this to, let's say, that painting over there on the easel, then I can't take my conversation with this painting and simply slip over here. When I was teaching and I would have 10 students coming in during the afternoon or the day, then I'm not going to take what... Uh, John told me about his work when uh, Rosemary is coming in now with her work. There has to be a, um, an understanding to be at one with whatever you're doing. So whatever the next painting is, it might be that one there or something else, I can't schlep into the new. So I keep working on a work, layer upon layer upon layer upon layer, and it changes dramatically. Like I told you, there was a 9 by 14 foot painting, of which I cut out a little hunk and threw that painting away, and that hunk became a genesis of a universe. So uh, that doesn't mean I have compartmentalization, but there are boundaries within an experience, and I want to be sure I, I uh, don't drag from one painting into the other.